Lillian awakened to find herself tied upright to a chair. When she moved, she felt a warm bulk behind her. What she now guessed was her husband. They were tied back to back in a dark, cold chamber that smelled strongly of dank decay and rotted matter. Her vision was blurry and coupled with the heavy darkness, she could make no analysis of her surroundings other than she felt by the nature of the atmosphere that they were most certainly underground. They've locked us in the cellar, she thought as she raised her head and squinted in order to see the pale, bleached white piles of rubble which lay in the corners of the room. After a time, her eyes adjusted to the pitch black darkness, and she could now identify the piles as a collection of bones scattered in profusion over the soft dirt of the floor. At times, she thought she saw movement on the far wall, but she could not identify any details of the shape other than its size, which was roughly that of a small to medium-sized dog. She called to Peter three times, but realizing he was still unconscious, decided it best to once more try to assess more of her environment. She could see a staircase of dark wooden steps rising on the wall directly in front of her, and a table set far off to her right side. She felt oddly relaxed, and her body would not respond to the commands her brain was issuing. She had no memory after she had been given the wine other than the strange image of the woman she had seen sitting on the piano bench, gazing at her as she slipped into unconsciousness. The woman had been a pale-skinned blonde in a black dress, looking at her with pity and sad concern. It had seemed as if the others had not even noticed her presence. And now, as Lillian focused on the memory, she felt certain that the woman held a certain vague familiarity. Lillian had always had a strong tolerance to drugs of any kind, a trait which Peter had always half-jokingly attributed to her long lineage of hard-drinking Irish ancestors. Only two years before, she had awakened in the middle of a dental surgery when the anesthesia had worn off prematurely, and the orthodontist had in a panic administered another dose double of what he would normally use for a man twice Lillian's size in order to sedate her once more. She guessed that Peter was most likely still completely under the influence of whatever drug had been used, while she was now almost completely recovered and alert. She forced herself to remain calm and resist the terror which was threatening to overrun her mind. She knew that most definitely they were in the most dangerous situation of her life, and if she allowed herself to crumble, there would be no hope of them surviving. The shape, which she kept seeing crawling in the shadows, was now a dark mass moving over the piles of bones as if searching the remains with determined hunger, scavenging for scraps amongst the refuse. Lillian began to push against the solid wrap of duct tape which had been wound around her ankles, wrist, and chest. She found the bonds tight and unbreakable. Once more, panic threatened to force her into tears of hopelessness. She wanted to thrash and scream, but the thought of attracting the dark thing's attention held her terror in check. How could this be happening? She wished and prayed that Peter would awaken and comfort her with his expertise in police training. Surely he would have some idea of how to escape, or at least could calm her with his presence. However, a horrible thought appeared in her mind as she watched the dark thing crawling over the bones. What if Peter was dead? What if they had administered too great a dose of whatever drug they had given him? And now he was lifeless and cold behind her in the chair. She closed her eyes and listened. Yes, she could still hear his breath, shallow and steady in the darkness. And also, above, she could hear voices. Emmerich stood at the window watching as the snow fell in the darkness outside. The others were gathered behind him in the study, arguing silently amongst each other. They dared not raise their voices and risk inviting his wrath upon them. Such a peculiar situation, he said out loud, as he turned to face their desperate, cadaverous faces. What are we going to do, Emmerich? Helen's hysteria was becoming tedious and exhausting. That man! 
He's a cop. Somebody's going to come looking for him. What happens if we are arrested? Frida said as she stared wildly into the flames of the roaring fireplace. Even though they knew that the warmth was hastening their decomposition, the cold they felt in their limbs demanded increasing heat. Exactly, Ellen exclaimed. What will become of us if our condition is discovered? I will not let that happen, Emmerich said, placing a cold, pallid hand on Adelbert's shoulder as he sobbed in the chair beside him. You have a plan then, Meryl, ever the faithful one said, with hope shining in her dry, milky eyes. Let us just go. Let's flee somewhere safe. We can just kill the cop in the beach and get out of here. Darius had always been more than willing to murder and flee. Oh, my dear ones, Emmerich said, smiling with blue, bloodless lips. Where could we go and not be noticed? I fear that our game is at an end. Their eyes widened with fear as they saw him withdraw the loaded pistol. Their bodies were now stiff and without reaction, but Alan and Frida still tried to rise as they saw the shot Emmerich fired into Adelbert's temple. Emmerich raised his free hand and with a simple exertion of his will, held them in their place. Quickly, he fired off single shots into their heads and soon was alone with only the sound of the crackling of fire. still bodies and watching lifeless eyes. I will bring you back when all is well, but for now you are safer with me than in these rotting shells. Emmerich calmly walked through the portrait which hung on the wall and carefully took it down to view the safe hidden behind. He turned the dial slowly and was just reaching for the latch when he heard a sound in the distance. He stopped and turned his head, listening carefully as the clear ring of sirens howled outside the window. He turned, and stepping over Frida's body, stared out into the night, where he could see flashes of blue and red light appearing on the other side of the yard gate. Instantly he whirled and rushed back to the safe, only to stop frozen in his place by what he saw. The safe door was already open and the compartment within was already empty. He glanced around the room in confusion as he looked at the corpses for some change in their position, but all still lay motionless where they had been slain. As realization dawned on him with growing, vengeful rage, he shouted, Petra! Petra! You whore! You cannot stop me! I'll catch you again, you dirty slut. But when I do, you will never know a moment's peace for the rest of eternity. As he stood shaking his fists at the silence of the room, he heard laughter echoing from the hallway. The dark thing had crossed behind Lillian out of her vision. She imagined it crawling slowly towards Peter and felt terror at the thought of it sitting hunched at his feet like an unfed pet sniffing at a morsel. She called Peter's name twice more and rocked in the creaking wooden chair in another attempt to awaken him but only silence followed. She felt warm tears streaking down her cheeks and bit her lip as she resisted yet another scream. It was then in the silence that she heard a clicking and a long groan as light shone down the steps from the upstairs. She waited to hear footsteps, but there were none. Even as she saw the dim form moving down the steps, there was no sound to complement the movement. As the figure arrived at the bottom of the stairs, she could see the vague outline of a small female form as it came closer with long pale arms barely visible in the dim light from above. In a moment the figure stood before her and she detected a light flowery scent mixed with that of cigarettes. Gathering her courage she stared directly at the form and forced herself to sound stern and calm as she said, 
if you let us go, I promise we will not say a word. The figure stood still only a meter from her feet, and Lillian thought she could see a hint of golden hair enshrouding the woman's face. Now she was sure that it was a woman she had seen sitting on the bench upstairs. Lillian's blood froze to ice within her veins as she saw the glint of a long knife in the hands of the stranger. She watched as the woman approached and leaning over her slid the knife delicately between the flesh of her arm and the tape which bound her to the wooden arm of the chair. In one quick movement the blade cut through the gray adhesive fabric as the woman whispered in her ear, Dietrich sent me to help you. She spoke with a soft, lovely voice in English, with the trace of a German accent. Lillian let forth a startled laugh of pure relief and joy as the woman cut her free. Oh, dear Lord, thank you, she whispered back as her legs were unbound and she stood stiff and wobbly from long hours without movement. We must be quick, the woman said as she handed the knife to Lillian. Cut your husband free. Lillian did as she was instructed and took only a moment to feel Peter's pulse and shake him, but he still did not respond. You will have to carry him, the woman said as she handed another object to Lillian. For a brief instant their hands met and Lillian felt the woman's icy cold touch and shuddered. As Lillian examined the object she realized that it was Peter's revolver. Lillian looked up and for the first time her eyes met those of the woman and she stood petrified as she finally recognized the face which peered at her from beneath the blonde hair in the darkness of the cellar. She had seen those same large sad eyes staring out from an old black and white photo on the back of a book in her sister's bedroom as a young girl. Lillian realized that she was standing face to face with none other than Petra Strauss. I, I know you. I mean, I, I've seen your... There is no time, Petra interrupted. You must do exactly as I say. Take your husband and help him up the stairs. If you see the blonde man you met at the gate, you must shoot him in the head as many times as you can. You cannot hesitate even for an instant or he will kill you both. The police are outside the wall right now, and they will be coming up to the gate in moments. You just have to make it to the front door. Do you understand? Yes, but how can you? Petra placed one cold finger on Lillian's lips to silence her. Then turning, she walked to the foot of the stairs and gazing up into the light gestured for them to follow. Lillian lifted Peter's arm over her shoulder, and to her joy, he groaned and began to look up, as if from the depths of a deep trance. He tried to speak, but could formulate no words with his unresponsive tongue. Quiet, Peter. You have to stand and help me, she whispered in his ear with terrified urgency. His eyes were closed and his weight ponderous and awkward, but she managed to support his bulk enough to half drag him to the steps and begin the ascent. She took one last look at the cellar to see if there was any sign of the dark thing which had so frightened her, but it appeared to be gone or hiding. She looked up and saw the woman gazing at her from a few steps up. There was something down here with us, Lillian said, as she began to pull Peter groggily up the steps one by one. Yes, I know, Petra said distantly. What was it? Lillian said, stopping for a moment as Petra fixed her with her gaze. I could not explain. Even if we had time, she answered before turning and climbing to the top of the steps. Hurry, before he comes and catches you. After succeeding in reaching the top, Lillian paused and leaned Peter against the wall as she tried to recover her strength. It was then that Petra whirled and hissed, Here he comes! Get ready! Lillian's hands were shaking as she crouched behind the wall behind the silver door in the dining room. She glanced to where Petra had just been standing, but the woman had vanished. Lillian heard solid, heavy footsteps across the wooden floor and carefully removed the safety and cocked the hammer on the pistol. Peter was slumped against the wall, barely able to support himself. She said a prayer in her mind and asked for forgiveness for what she was about to do. 
but the faces of her children now flashed in her mind, and she knew she could not take the chance in allowing them to lose their parents. She whirled around the corner. What she saw sent a wave of cold jetting over her flesh like a blast of arctic wind. Her mouth went completely dry as time seemed to stop. In the brief instant, she beheld her captor. His eyes were sunken and milky within hollow dark sockets and the bluish white face on which the skin seemed to be sagging unnaturally. His hair was a limp, stringy, blonde mess which now hung over his forehead in filthy, tangled clumps. His bony, clawed hand held an old German pistol. He was raising it as his mouth sneered into a vicious grimace of stained yellow teeth. As Helene looked into his eyes, and saw a bottomless well of seething hatred and emptiness, she found that despite her previous reservations towards killing, she wanted more than anything, as if by some deep natural impulse, to destroy the creature where it stood. She pulled the trigger, and a shot cracked from the barrel, followed by five more, and she felt a sense of elation as the rotted thing's head was blasted into pulp. She heard a crash in the other room, and she watched as police SFOs appeared at the doorway with drawn weapons. One called out for her to drop the pistol, which she did, as tears began to run from her eyes, and she wept into her hands. The officer immediately recognized her, and rushed to her side as paramedics entered and began checking Peter. The officer guided her to a chair as others swarmed the house and began their search. Mrs. White, are you injured? A young female paramedic said as she examined her eyes with a pen light. Lillian looked up and grabbed the woman's arm with a steel grip. Get us out of this fucking place now! So, what have we got? Inspector Lebron asked as he stepped from his car to see Lillian and Peter White being walked from the house to the yellow ambulance. Officer James raised the visor of his helmet and looked at the inspector with a troubled expression. Seven bodies, sir. Are they missing persons? Reported from Berlin. Yes, sir. I believe so. But we have a bit of an issue. What's that then? Sir. All these people are in an advanced state of decomposition. Even the man that Lillian White apparently shot appears to have already been dead for weeks. That doesn't make any sense. How could the Whites have been taken hostage if everyone here is already dead? There's more, sir. Six of the corpses appear to have been shot recently. By Lillian? No, sir. They were shot by a 22 caliber round, probably fired from the Ruger we found in the hands of the body shot by Mrs. White. The thing is, the gun was apparently fired recently. We won't know the details until Forensics gets a better look. So, you think that Lillian shot six corpses with the Ruger, and then shot another corpse with her husband's 38? Inspector LeBron was beginning to get the very strange, disorienting feeling of having stumbled into an enigma. No, sir. By all appearances, the Whites were tied up in the cell until very recently. From the looks of things, they were bound in duct tape. We're not even really sure how they got loose. Lillian is in no state to speak of it, and Peter's still drugged. We think they were given GHB, but the lab will have to confirm it. None of this makes any sense at all. Heide Dua was among the corpses, correct? Yes. We believe one of the bodies is hers. Heide Dua just arrived here a few days ago. There's still more, sir. Oh, sweet lord, what? The cellar is filled with bones that must have been here for many years. We've already counted something like 20 skulls. What the hell is going on here, James? We don't know. 
It had been three days since Dietrich had crawled from his snowbound apartment building and finally made his way to headquarters for his first briefing on what had happened in England. For the first few hours of that morning, he had almost managed to convince himself that Petra had been a hallucination evoked by the unrelenting torment of his alcohol abuse and subsequent withdrawal. However, as he sat listening to the statements made by the London police, he had been forced into the powerful realization that everything which had occurred was due to the influence of the dead woman's spirit. He had listened to the statements made by Peter and Lillian and immediately noticed the stunning gaps of what he knew had to be information they had withheld. The London squad was baffled by what they had found at the house in Surrey, and Diedrich had been told that he was to travel to Britain and affirm that these were the missing persons involved in his case. He was lightly reprimanded for involving Peter White without authorization, but requesting information from another European department was far from unheard of, and it was understood that Diedrich had not been responsible for the detective and his wife involving themselves as they had. Whatever the sedation caused by his interaction with Petra had long since worn off, and Diedrich had found himself edgy and nervous for all of the hours leading up to his journey. Now free to go where he may, he had found the temptation to drink looming around every corner of the city. He had distracted himself writing reports and puffing away on his grandfather's pipe, but at every free moment his mind turned to alcohol. Before leaving, he had visited a physician whom he had confessed his condition, and the doctor had suggested he enter a rehabilitation program. Diedrich had explained that he would take this into strong consideration, but at the moment he was neck deep in an important case and required some means of soothing his nerves. The doctor had reluctantly prescribed him Valium with the explicit directions that he only use the pill so that he could sleep and be extremely cautious as to the amount he took. Diedrich had thanked the doctor after explaining that the last thing he wanted was to become addicted to yet another substance or risk an accidental overdose. Diedrich arrived in London and soon found the white suburban cottage nestled behind a rusted iron fence on a narrow street of like houses. He had exited the cab and was halted at the gate by three barking Yorkshire terriers that seemed intent on holding him at bay with a vicious barrage of high-pitched barks and growls as they bounded in the snowdrifts like wild rabbits. He saw the front door open and there stood Peter in a blue robe, black socks and slippers, holding a cup of coffee in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Diedrich had been told that he had taken a leave of absence to recover from his misadventure and spend some time with his family. Knowing Peter as he did, Diedrich guessed that this meant that his old friend was seldom properly dressed and rarely leaving the house. Peter called off the pack of Yorkies and waved Diedrich onward. Diedrich entered through the creaking gate and was soon surrounded as the dogs turned back from the doorstep and began anxiously sniffing at his ankles as he approached. As he climbed the steps and entered, they followed, eyeing him suspiciously the entire time. He stomped the snow from his shoes and placed his coat on a peg by the door as he walked into the small, cluttered living room. Football was on the television and the house smelled of coffee and bacon as he followed Peter into the kitchen. Lillian was seated at the table, feeding the baby in his high chair, as Peter's daughter sat with her head bobbing to music which played through her headphones as she ate. There's the man now, Lillian said with mock disgust. We've been expecting you, Mr. Habendorf. Diedrich gazed at her with no small amount of shame as he sat down. Lily, Peter said with weariness as he ran his hand over his balding head. We've gone over this now far too many times. You cannot blame Dieter for what happened. Oh, can't I? She said, not taking her eyes from Diedrich's. We were the ones who went tromping around the countryside with no idea what we were getting ourselves into. He could have mentioned that there was a damn cult of psychopaths hiding out in the house when he asked you to investigate. Her voice was stern as she held up another spoonful of mush for the baby who was smiling with a food-smeared face at Diedrich. Lillian, I did not know, Diedrich began, before she cut him short with a wave of the spoon. I know you had no idea. I don't blame you, Dieter. We were fools, but have you been to the morgue? He nodded grimly. Those were your missing persons, weren't they? Yes, and the man you shot was the one who had tried to kill me in Berlin. 
and he still had the wounds from when you shot him. Her eyes were intense and burning with excitement, Peter said, silently listening, his eyes studying Diedrich with the trained faculty of an experienced policeman. Diedrich had spent the entire trip to England trying to devise exactly what he was going to tell his two friends. Yes, and before you ask, it has been established that it is impossible that those people were living when you arrived at the house. Peter and Lillian looked at each other, and Diedrich knew that this is one of many conversations they'd had concerning the subject. Look, Dita, Peter said, leaning over the table and speaking confidentially. Although his daughter still remained seemingly oblivious to Diedrich's presence, those bastards were talking and walking when they took us hostage. I don't know what the hell is going on. But you damn well better not be here to tell me that we're crazy. Diedrich looked at him thoughtfully, and just as he was beginning to wish that the couple was not so angry at him, he saw them visibly begin to relax, as if by some effect of his desire. Far from it, he answered, as he placed his hand on Peter's, and saw the warmth shine in his friend's eyes. I am well aware that there were a great many strange things which had occurred to which I am ashamed to ever have involved you two. If any harm had befallen you, then I would never would have forgiven myself. You are both two of the bravest people I have ever known, and I thank God that you are both here with me now. I don't know that I can explain what happened as I do not fully understand it myself, but I know for a fact that everything you told me is true and none of it was imagined. I can only say for certain that you put an end to one of the foulest men to have ever walked this planet. If you truly believe us then, Dita, then tell me something, Lillian said as she locked his eyes with her own. Anything, he answered, as her stare bored into the core of his mind. Tell me why the ghost of Petra Strauss rescued us from that cellar. What then followed was one of the longest and strangest conversations that Diedrich had ever had. But by deciding that he owed the Whites too much to dilute the truth even a little, he had opened the floodgates to confessing everything which had happened over the past month. During the course of the talk, the Whites' daughter left to go to her friends and the baby was placed in his crib for a nap. They sat at the kitchen table drinking coffee as Diedrich attempted to verbalize the bizarre offense which sounded like a raving lunatic. So, you buggered a ghost then, Peter said with a laugh, even though Diedrich hadn't gone into the details concerning his relationship with the late Petra Strauss, that he would surmised as much from the gist of his account. And we were worried that you would think we were crazy. Diedrich looked down at the table and smiled sadly. I haven't seen her since the night she came to me and told me about you two. We had no idea your drinking had gotten so severe, Peter said as he lit a cigarette. What are you going to do now? I told her that I was going to help her children. And I will. But I don't really even know where to start. I thought she would contact me again. Her son is in Manchester, Lillian said calmly. He's somewhat of a celebrity there. This all sounds insane, doesn't it? Diedrich said as he withdrew his pipe from within his coat. Peter eyed it with a surprised expression. Good lord, man, what is that? It's my grandfather's. I've taken to smoking it. What are the police going to do, Dita? Lillian's cold demeanor could barely disguise the fear lurking just below the surface. They won't be able to explain what happened, but they know what we said was true. I believe that they will fill in the spaces where they can, and will turn a blind eye where they cannot. Diedrich struck a match and began to slowly puff clouds of smoke from his mouth. From what I understand, they have already developed a theory that there were others in the house that escaped before their arrival, and it was these individuals who were responsible for kidnapping you. 
Now you may find this a bit insulting, but it seems they believe that you were somewhat hysterical upon your escape from the cellar. Combined with the fact that you had recently been drugged, it makes for a reasonable assumption that you might have hallucinated certain events. If I were you, I would not argue these in future interviews. So, they think there may have been others who had killed the group earlier, Peterson thoughtfully. But how does that explain the decomposition of the bodies? Lillian was already showing signs of disdain at being labeled a hysterical woman. It doesn't. But knowing investigators as I do, I am willing to conjecture that they will become very creative in their explanations. It will be very easy to say that those members of the group which we trailed from Berlin were in fact going to meet others here in England that are still at large. But the ones found dead at the house had already been present and dead for weeks. Peter's expression was one of a man in the process of developing a migraine. They may come to believe that we were mistaken in our identification of the suspects who left Berlin. Peter nodded as he rubbed his temples. It would be no great leap for the London authorities to assume incompetence from the Berlin police. And when I came up the stairs, I saw a corpse in a chair and hallucinated he was attacking me before shooting. Lillian could not argue the logic. Precisely. And the ghost told you that you're a psychic, Lillian laughed. If that were true, then how did I see her? Perhaps you are gifted as well. Diedrich studied her carefully as she rolled her eyes. Just when I thought this conversation couldn't get any more ridiculous, she scoffed. Really, I do not find it so hard to fathom, Diedrich said with great seriousness. Nor do I, Peter added as he gazed at his wife with curious wonder. Whatever do you mean by that? She said, standing and walking to the teapot, which sat on the stove. Think, Lily, Peter said, taking her arm gently. Why were you so insistent on joining me in Brookwood? I wanted to spend time with you, she answered matter-of-factly. My dear, you gave up a shopping trip to go walking in a cemetery. Diedrich leaned forward and looked at his friends as if seeing them for the first time. Lillian, have you considered what might have happened to Peter if you hadn't gone with him? She looked down at the stove for a moment and seemed on the verge of tears. I haven't stopped thinking about it since we left. But it was hardly a psychic premonition. I just felt like I wanted to be with him. The idea sound like fun, to be honest. We haven't had an adventure in years. Well, we certainly got that. Peter sighed. Eric Drescher had never known his parents. He had been only an infant when he was dropped off at his aunt's house by his father soon after his mother's suicide. His aunt's husband owned a sheep farm in the Panine Moors, and he had grown up wandering the countryside, blissfully unaware of the tragic history from which he had been spawned. Inevitably, he had reached the age to begin school. He had begun to hear the rumors, and the rumors had all been proven true. The distance between himself and his schoolmates had begun almost immediately. He was precocious and had begun to write and read at a rate that far exceeded the abilities of other children. He was shy and introverted, which had only added to his alienation as he began to compose and draw while others his age were still learning their alphabet. His sister had virtually none of the same problems as him. She was beautiful and socially accepted by all the other children. Whatever tragedies had marred her earlier years were lost and forgotten to her, it seemed. While he was regularly admonished for his lack of interest in friends and popularity, she was invited to parties and followed by a steady throng of admirers wherever she went. Eric 
would have been jealous if it were not for his complete lack of interest in all the things which she seemed to hold so dear. It would not be until later that he would find himself the center of attention in a very different way. He was only ten years old when he first started to see the spirits. He would glimpse them on the moors, or see a wispy shade wandering the hall of their house at night. He was not frightened of them, as they seemed to be completely oblivious to him, and he doubted that they could bring him harm even if they weren't. Most often they seemed lost and confused. He had made the mistake of mentioning their presence to his sister, and she had immediately reported his story to their aunt. This had initiated a round of visits to a psychologist, and soon he would never tell another soul of what he saw on the moors again, at least not verbally. He wrote of the ghosts in cryptic poems, which soon drew the attention of teachers who praised the writing, but were uneasy over the subject. By the time he reached middle school, everyone knew about his hobby, and this would lead to the next step in his artistic evolution. There were a group of students who met often in the city to play music together, and it was their hopes to start a punk band. What they felt they needed was a lead singer who could write songs that would set them apart from the other sex pistol imitators that had sprung up all over Manchester. Despite his relative abhorrence of the music which they had been currently playing, Eric had reluctantly accepted an invitation to write some songs for their band. Then one day, they had asked him to sing. Come on, man. All you gotta do is shout over the music, Ned, the guitar player, had said. Eric had given in to their pressures, but found the shouting too exhausting and unnerving. So after a few rehearsals, he had taken to singing in a low monotone. The band, sensing that this might be a good thing, had changed their style slightly to accommodate his vocals. After a year of trial and error, what they produced was an aesthetically dark and minimalist sounding style that, when matched with his low singing and dark lyrics, created a haunting and eerie music which was vastly different than anything currently being played in the city. We've got to have a good name, Ned had said one night as they sat in his parents' garage smoking cigarettes and drinking warm lager. How about something to do with the occult, Mick had offered as he spun his drumsticks between his fingers. I mean, all the songs are about bloody ghosts and tombs, Ned was thumbing over an old paperback of The Hobbit when he stopped on a page near the first few chapters. Hey, mates, what about necromancer? They had all looked at each other thoughtfully. Come on, we've got some lovey stuff too, Litton, the bass player, had offered. Shorten it, Eric said as he wrote on his notebook. Not necromancer, but necromance. Yeah, like a combination of necromancy and romance, bloody brilliant, Ned smiled with triumph. When the group first began playing parties, and eventually on the Manchester club scene, they were thereafter known as the Necromats, and to their amazement, they were immediately a hit. They shunned the ragged metal-studded look of the other bands, and instead opted for a dark, well-dressed style which soon became a fad favored by their fans. In three years, they signed their first record deal, and soon, Necromance was being heard all over England, and eventually Europe. Much to Eric's shock and inner turmoil, he had become a celebrity, and with this new career came another fringe benefit which he had not foreseen. Drugs. He and the other members of the band had begun experimenting while they were still playing clubs, but with the release of their first album, a tale of woe, access to substances had become easy and cheap. First had come marijuana, then had come pills, and finally some cocaine and heroin. By the time Eric celebrated his 21st birthday, he was shooting up a minimum of three times a day, and he hadn't seen a spirit in years. It was now, as he watched his bandmates reveling in the spoils of their success, that he had begun brooding over the shadows of his past. It had not escaped media attention that he was the offspring of the famous Petra Strauss and Emmerich Drescher. 
there had been entire articles written comparing his lyrics to their poetry, and now he was left with the overwhelming sense that he was caught in the current of some cold river of fate's intention. He despised the attention he received and found himself increasingly reclusive in his personal life. While on tour, he would lock himself away in his hotel room while the others indulged in all-night parties. He would lay in bed, drugged and only semi-lucid as his thoughts went further and further down into a very dark place. To a junkie, overdose is always a looming possibility. Even the most cautious and knowledgeable heroin addict can acquire a particularly pure and potent patch without knowing. Eric had become acutely aware of just how easy it would be to let himself slip away. One night while playing in London, he had received a message that his father had died. Through all the years of his success and popularity, he had never even received as much as a letter or phone call from the man who had donated such a substantial amount of his DNA to Eric's physiology. That night, he had felt nothing in regard to that man's demise, but alone in his room, he had begun to brood over all the things he had learned about his parents' relationship. He had always hated his mother for her selfish decision to end her own pain and leave her innocent children behind as victims to be ravaged by a callous world. However, even this hatred was diluted by empathy for the pain she had suffered at the hands of a soulless husband. She had in Eric's mind been an unfortunate and sensitive soul much like himself, but for his father there was nothing but contempt. Emmerich Drescher had been an obscene and soulless monster who had no more regard for his own offspring than for a dog he no longer wished to care for. So why did Eric feel a, a loss at his death? Perhaps it was only that now he could never tell that evil bastard of the devastation he had wrought in the lives of his family. Or maybe it was the secret inner longing of every child that maybe somewhere in his father's heart there had been some remorse for what he had done. Maybe a foolish child's dream that his father was in fact a man and that somewhere within him he had loved his only son. These thoughts nurtured his sorrow into an overwhelming in his inescapable despair that night, and when he had filled the syringe he knew he was going to take far too much. Stumbling into the hotel bathroom he had vomited it, and then lay cold and dying in a ball by the toilet as his lungs fought desperately to continue to supply his blood with oxygen. It had been then that he had first noticed the dark thing which he glimpsed moving like a shadow across the ceiling from the corner of his half-open eyes. It made a sound like the rustling of cloth being dragged over the tile. He could not move to look upon it, but he sensed that it was very, very close. For a moment it seemed as if something were touching him. He felt a light push against his shoulder, and then a weight over his back as something bristly and sharp like needles brushed against his cheek. Just when he thought it was going to cover his face, it withdrew, and soon, once more the sound of shuffling came from behind him. The shadow was crossing over the ceiling and he had the impression that it was moving behind the opaque glass shower door around the bath. He forced his eyes open so that he could see the dark shape as it crawled down the wall and into the basin of the bathtub. He could hear it moving along the porcelain as he watched the door slide open a few inches. Through the heavy fog of the massive drug paralysis, he now felt a sharp and sobering fear as he heard a voice whisper through the crack. Hello, Eric. The sound was low, whispering an alien. He could not respond. I know that this being our first meeting, you may feel a bit confused as to the nature of my presence. I must assure you that I mean no harm. As a 
matter of fact, you might consider me an old friend of the family. Eric's eyes were now open, and the startling cold he felt was only increasing as he saw a strange, massive, insect-like wing pass in the narrow opening of the door. Now, it seems evident that you are in a bit of a bad situation, young man. I don't know if you realize this, but you are in fact hovering ever so closely on the verge of death. I do not think I would be exaggerating if I were to say that if in the next few minutes you were to close your eyes and go to sleep, you will surely not awaken. Eric heard this and for a moment tried to move his arms but found his limbs numb and useless. If death is what you wish, then I will in no way attempt to hinder the process which is underway. However, if by some small chance you feel that this may not be the option which you would choose to pursue, I am more than willing to offer you an alternative. Eric watched as a long, black appendage reached up from the tub and pushed the door open a few more inches. If this particular life is not one which you have found satisfactory, then may I offer you another path. I can give you another world in which to explore, Eric. There are possibilities and experiences which you have never dreamed of. You must ask yourself if you truly wish to join the ranks of the pathetic drifting specters which you may have witnessed on several occasions in your childhood. I can give you power over life and death, Eric. All you have to do is nod your head and give me your consent. Eric stared at the shower door and now in the final minutes of his life finally felt the dread which had eluded him. He gazed into the darkness of the void and the thought of dying at last did not seem some sweet release but instead a frightening and endless nightmare. He did not want to die lying on the floor of a hotel bathroom with vomit dripping from his mouth. He fought against the cold immobility with the last of his strength and managed to move his head slightly in a nod of agreement. The creature did not hesitate. The door of the shower flew open as the giant fly leapt out and flew at him with wings and beat like the whirling of propellers. It landed upon him with enough force that he rolled onto his back as it lay upon his chest crawling and grasping as it moved its massive head over his. He gazed up into the multifaceted eyes and opened his mouth to scream, but as his lips parted, he saw the long protrusion issue forth from the mouth of the thing and force itself down his throat. There was a brief moment of intense agony as his chest felt punched and clawed from within, and then came a calming, warm sensation, as if he was being filled with burning bright blue light. And somewhere to his side, he thought, he could hear a woman crying. Diedrich walked through the lobby of the hotel with a sudden sense of urgency. Up until now, he had been carefully planning how he was to introduce himself to Eric Drescher. He told the clerk at the registry that he was a police inspector from Germany who was there to question Drescher about his father, but even then the solemn young woman who had been reluctant to relinquish the room number, Diedrich had reached out with his mind and created an artificial familiarity with the woman. She gazed at him pensively before her mask of resistance melted into a smile and she had given him the number. 
Daedric felt a quick stab of guilt as he realized that influencing others in such a way was becoming second nature. To be wielding such abilities seemed slightly immoral, but it was becoming an involuntary reflex now that he could not control, even when he desired. He entered the elevator and pressed the button for the third floor. As the doors slowly closed, he was suddenly hit with a blast of cold which had almost flung him against the wall as Petra stood before him for the first time since that night in Berlin. Immediately, he realized that there was something different about her. She no longer held the same solid physical presence to which he had become accustomed. She was pale and transparent, and her eyes were shining with a clear, white, unearthly light as she frantically grabbed and clutched at his chest, each contact bringing a fresh wave of biting cold. She was mouthing something over and over, but no sound was leaving her lips. He concentrated and attempted to understand the words, but all he could make out was one phrase repeated again and again. Emmerich's God is here. Emmerich's God is here. As soon as she had appeared, she vanished. And from his shock, he felt the elevator drop slightly into place as the doors opened. He exited quietly and ran down the hall, glancing at the room numbers until he came to room 36. He knocked on the door with his shaking, nerve-wracked fist, but there was no response. He put his ear against the wood and called out, Eric, Eric Drescher, can I have a word with you? Still, there was no answer. He stood back and looked to see if there was anyone else present in the hallway, but he was alone. He was just beginning to position himself to kick the door when he heard a click from within, and the door crept open. Carefully, he pushed it further and saw that the interior of the room was dark as he detected a strange scent like food going sour hanging in the air. Herr Drescher, my name is Inspector Abendroth and I have come to speak with you. Now inside he saw that the bathroom door was open and the light from within was falling over a chair by the window where a figure sat with its face hidden in shadow. Of course, a strange low voice answered. You've come to talk with me about my father. Yes, I hate to bother you at such a late hour. I assure you that it is very important that we speak. May I turn on the light? No. I would prefer it if you did not. I've been quite upset, and I would hate for you to see me weeping. Dietrich did not detect any trace of grief in the man's voice. Please, Inspector, sit down. The man raised his arm and pointed to a chair across the table from him. Dietrich cautiously sat down and studied the man's face through the shadow. He had seen magazine photos of Eric Drescher and recognized the eerie similarity to the early photographs of his young father. He was of a medium muscular build with only the stubble of blonde hair and beard on his head and face. The eyes which Diedrich had seen in pictures had been deep set, penetrating and gray, but now, presently, they were dark and hidden. I am deeply sorry that to burden you at this time. Dietrich's words were consoling, but the aura of darkness and disdain he felt from the singer was unnerving. Once more he detected the rotting odor, which now had taken on the scent of tainted meat. It's fine, but there is nothing that I can tell you. I've never even met my father. My grief is merely a regret that I will never now have the chance to know him. Diedrich found the man's words distinctly false and rehearsed, as if he were reading them from a script. Diedrich was sensing a profound and eminent danger, but he reminded himself that he was here to try and help Eric Drescher if it were at all possible. His eyes quickly surveyed the room and in the darkness by the bed he saw an unfolded piece of foil, a spoon, 
syringe. Eric, may I call you that? He watched the man's head nod robotically. Do you need some kind of help? To be honest with you, Mr. Abendroth, <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeling very well. There was an empty humor in the singer's voice. It seems that a little while ago, I may have overdosed on heroin. Dietrich stared at the dark figure and saw the telltale track marks at the crook of his elbow. Do you want me to call an ambulance? He said, but was answered only by a sullen chuckle. <laughs> no. I fear it's far too late, Cheshire said as he leaned into the light, revealing pale, bluish skin and milky, dead eyes. I'm fairly certain that I died. Dietrich shrank back in horror as Dresher's mouth opened, and he vomited a huge pile of maggots onto the table between them. Diedrich fell from the chair and backed away across the floor as the singer's corpse stood laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you are too late. <laughs> Best be on your way. Eric's corpse lunged forward and snatched Diedrich from the floor as if he were a rag doll and threw him across the room. He slammed into the wall with the force of a vehicular collision and for an instant his vision went black as the air in his lungs was pushed from his mouth by the impact. He felt a quick snap in his ribs, but had no time to recover before Eric had leapt upon him again and began squeezing his throat with a cold, vice-like grip. Diedrich could feel enough strength in the creature's grasp to break his neck like a dried branch. You are a fool, Appendroth. The thing laughed, its breath a wave of noxious, sour decay. <laughs> you, you should have come to the house yourself, instead of sending that old fat cop and his stupid bitch. I had a good thing going with old Emmerich. We had years of fun and games left ahead of us before that slut wife of his started meddling. Dietrich could feel his hold on consciousness weakening as he fought for air. I was going to renew my contract with Emmerich's whelp, but he died before I could get in. I can still use him though. I will not make the same mistakes with him. I'm going to get much more hands on with this one. No more hiding in cellars and cemeteries waiting for their stupid little parties. I've got plans, Abendroth. This one is famous. He's got money and access to all the right kind of people. As Diedrich began to slip into blackness, he heard a whisper in the depths of his mind from a voice he recognized all too well. It was Petra, and she was saying, Take his power. Use his energy. Steal it, Diedrich. Steal it now. Diedrich took the last of his remaining strength and grasped the creature by its wrists. Then, as he fought, he felt a reaction beginning within him. It began as an impulse as basic as swimming for the surface of a pool after one had dived too deep. He was fighting and struggling for the surface, and at the surface there was a clear blue light. At that moment, it felt as if he had broken through a frail glass wall. There was a rush of warmth and buzzing electrical energy which was vibrating in his hands and spreading down through the nerves in his arms. When it reached his chest, the grip on his throat slackened, and that was when he felt the creature try to back away. He opened his eyes and gazed into those of Eric's corpse, and there he saw with a sense of triumph a startled expression of shock and fear. Diedrich held Eric's arms and with a savage and angry glee began to siphon every drop of energy that he could from the possessed cadaver. It was fighting and pulling to get away, but Diedrich's body was now coursing with pure energy. Then, as if he had drained every last molecule of power from within the vessel, Eric fell limp and lifeless to the floor. 
Dietrich stood awash in exultation. He felt invincible and capable of obliterating the walls of the room with bursts of raw force. Even now, with this divine euphoria, there was another sensation gradually taking hold. Within him, he began to feel the yearning and the hunger for obscenity and death which had emanated from the creature. His mind was filled with visions of decomposing bodies and twisted, insane defilements. He staggered across the room and out the doors onto the balcony, where he leaned over the edge of the railing and gazed at the city below. For a moment, he felt a bleak impulse to fling himself over the edge, but instead he opened his mouth and screamed. In place of some cry of terror, he watched as a cloud of thousands of black buzzing insects exploded from his lips and swarmed upward into the dark night sky. He felt exhausted and sick. Gathering himself, he stood and stumbled back through the room past Eric Drescher's corpse. In the hallway, hotel security was emerging from the elevator, and as the two men approached, he pushed outward with his mind. At first, their eyes had locked on him, but now their stares had become glassy as they rushed past him, oblivious to his presence. He entered the elevator before the doors could close and breathed heavy, difficult breaths as he tried to collect himself. In the lobby, he forced himself to walk calmly past the clerk as he carefully erased himself from her memory. <laughs>